Hey, welcome to Coffee Tech Talk Tuesday. My name is John Ferguson, and uh, I'm the host of Coffee Tech Talk with Marty Rowe. How's it going, Marty? It's going great. Doing doing really well. I feel like you know, like I, I I feel like we just like I just saw you like the other day. It it was quick. Thanks for coming up to Kansas City. Um, yeah. Did, did you have a good time? I had a great time. You know, like I uh, you know I and we're gonna have a great time tonight too. Uh, we we've uh, we're gonna have on the show tonight. Uh, Michael uh, Tehan from I'm excited uh, about that. Yeah. I, and if you just go ahead and type, if any, if anybody's watching out there and you're like really coffee geeking out on all this stuff and you know, daily coffee news from roast magazine, I always like to do a shout out from roast magazine, but if you type in his name for daily coffee news and look at all the articles he's written, he's, he's contributed a lot to the industry and the advancement of uh, a lot of topics. So I'm, I'm excited that we get him, you know, we get him on the show tonight and we can <laughs> dive in and talk about a ton of stuff. So. That'll be you awesome. know, there's yeah. there, we'll talk a little bit about him before he gets on, so he can't argue with me. Um, right, exactly, and he's muted. There's all right. There's <laughs> oh, there's oh, but, some. Should we have him wave in the waiting room? That's he, he yeah, can wave. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's prove that he's here. I bring him in the wait, waving room. That's all I can. He, we have him in. The, we have him in a very special high tech garage. We built it ourselves, and we added a little bit Excellent. of seltzer water this time, and and you know some other stuff. There we so go. anyway, go for it. What I was going to say is there's a lot of groups out there. Every industry has their groups online that they all get together. And you have a whole plethora. You've got the entire gamut of melting pot of, of talents and, um, and things in, in any particular group. Well, uh, this one particular group that he and I are both on, um, I can guarantee that if someone posts a question, you'll get a splattering of inaccurate answers and some, some little off color stuff. But I can guarantee you if Mike Tehan comments, it's gonna be spot on and it's, it's gonna be drawn out. He's going to tell you why, he's gonna tell you how. He's not going to give you a one line answer. He's, he's going to teach you something. Hey, and remember that one time I was all concerned about uh, lead and getting the lead out of like I was like there's lead in the in the espresso machines and, we, and you were kind of like yeah I, I understand that but like let's 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 get someone you know maybe we'll find someone and then I realized that he's the one who wrote that article and exactly he's on the show tonight so we're gonna maybe uh chat about pest, that a little bit pester him a little bit about like what's going on with the uh, lead in our in our coffee yeah. like what's lead doing in our drinks how, <laughs> how could that be okay and why does California well, hate lead so much or everybody else too, for a good reason, because lead's terrible. But anyway, um, anyway, I did see you in Kansas City, and I, I have this picture Absolutely. of you pull, <laughs> pulling a shot of espresso. I gotta say, like, when you have an espresso technician setting up a brand new installed machine <laughs> with pure water, fresh espresso, you know, a brand new grinder, and someone who knows, like, that shot's gonna be good. And hey, I was like, and it's a rare experience to get that shot. And I was like, I, you know, barista, like uh, competitors and all that stuff. Like, that's fine. They do that all day. But like to get a technician like you behind the bar to pull uh, a shot and, and say, like, hey, kind. try this. And I'm like, no, that is something that not everybody gets. And I'm like, I was lucky enough to have that. So thank you so much because well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, you caught me at a good time because as any technician knows, we're there working through stuff. We're trial and, trial and error and we're correcting problems. And most of the stuff we do develops a, a bad shot. When we get it working right, we're gone. We're down, down the road. You come, you come in there at the exact perfect time. Yeah, like um, you're our most, that wasn't I, your first I shot, was, was it? tickled to death with it. It was the, it was like the second shot after we knew everything was working perfect. Yeah, and that, that and was so, a, that was a really decent shot. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously the coffee itself is, is a, is a is, could be as diverse as whatever, but it's, it's, sure. you know, the fact that you're bringing out the best in the coffee that you have with that machine, well, and that's, that's not the something goal. that everybody can do, right? That's, every, you know, well, every, how many? How many, shots have you pulled? how many shots have you pulled off a La Marzocco, right? Oh, well, in this area, you say La Marzocco, in this area in the Midwest, sure. that's probably the, the right. number one machine because there were some distributors here. Um, but I don't know when when we lose yeah. track. I definitely haven't pulled as many shots as a working barista, but, but yeah, we've pulled some shots. Um, 
a couple hundred. Um, and uh, this particular shop, um, they've got some unique stuff going on. They they sell wood fired roasted coffee. Um, yeah. And they they came to us because they wanted to kind of budget engineer. And so the two machines that they've got in there are uh, a, a service call Marty Re rebuilds um, total frame up um, powder coat the frame every nut and bolt got polished or replaced. Yeah. Um, so that I was I was real tickled to see you come in there. Sure. Well, I, show I'll, off some stuff. And you mentioned that like yes, a working barista like I I was myself for a long time and a shop owner. I've been pulling shots all the time. But when you pull a shot, you're not just pulling a shot. You're 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 managing and dialing in every shot that you're pulling. I mean, pretty much, right? So I mean, I would say that the value of each shot that you're pulling. I mean, it, it's for a customer, but it's also for a client that has many customers. So not to not to say that your your shots are more important than any other <laughs> shot, but in my book, it yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna stop. There, I'm gonna stop well, pulling your boat. Let's go on. <laughs> No, let me let me add one thing. They they are fairly new, and so I, I kind of take it upon myself to take on some of that responsibility to get them launched right, um, and uh, and help teach them that every espresso, good, bad, or indifferent, has its best extraction. Um, and so that's what we try to try to get them to before I leave. Well, so we're talking about espresso machines all night tonight. I mean, this is like the uh, espresso tech uh, episode, you know, like it we're, is. we're opening up every little can of worms and we're going to have like Michael do it for us. And like, I'll let's bring what. in, let's bring in Michael. You want to bring him yeah, in? Yeah, bring him in. We got, we're going to bring him in lickety split on this show. Michael, welcome hey. to the show. Coffee tech talk. What's up? How's it going? It's pretty painless. <laughs> right. I know yeah. we, we tried to make it easy. And you know, the first slide that I have here is because, um, I noticed that you were in a garage uh, that looks uh, pretty, you know, much like uh, a workshop. And then Marty, you looks like you're uh, in a workbench workshop. And I've got, I've got a little machine behind me too. This one just came out of a box. This one was easy, but um, you know, are you starting that new segment? What machines do you have behind you? Yes. I love yes. it. What machines do you it. have behind you? I could start with mine. Mine's the easiest. I got a, like a little uh, La Marzocco uh, mini and then uh, a, a, a K30, <laughs> um, which is in pretty nice condition. It's for like a little uh, a little cart that's going to be happening in Omaha, beautiful machines. So that's all I got, and a lamp. That's, and a lamp. Lamp. that's really cool. I, is that a machine, a lamp? Is a lamp a machine? <laughs> eh, I don't know, it produces light. I don't know. <laughs> What do you, what do you have, uh, Marty? And then, and then, well, then Michael- we'll, we'll Then let's to... quickly get to Michael, but um, yeah. we've, we've got the clover. Well, here. we talked about the club. You and still we, got the club. We've talked about that for no, a long no time. One's giving you, no that's, one's giving you 20 grand for it yet? So, well, no. Someone told me that's the equivalent to a, like a hunter's, um, uh, you know, big rack of something that they, they killed up yes. there with antlers on it. Well, that's, that's my, my Someday deal. it'll be worth and something. We, we teach a lot of classes. Um, and so one or teach a lot of people things. And so we've got just a standard old bun dual um, CWTF air pot brewer. Um, pretty, that's a really fun machine to uh, teach some fundamentals on both in the hydraulics and the electrical circuits. Pretty easy to understand. But you want to guess what we got here? And and I I'm going to full disclosure here. Michael and I and I it, it does my heart good to know that we've got some kinship here. Um, you won't see many of these components here. Um, this is going to be, it's, it's kind of the mid design, mid build of a Ludwig kick drum espresso machine with a, oh, I don't know what year, um, somewhere It'd in the early 70s. Early 70s, uh, I'm gonna take your word for it, but that's about the era I believed it was. Um, La Marzocco GS1. Um, I thought it might've been like a gyroscope for like a mouse or something. It looks um, like it's gonna like circulate, you know, like that. <laughs> no, that's, you're looking at the side of the kick drum. Yep. Um, I've seen is, that in person. You, you showed yeah. that to me. That's, that's, an, that's an impressive build. It, we're, we're gonna kind of do a little blend of mild and wild. It's, it's gonna be PID controlled and stuff, but with the GS1, you've got the fully mechanical. They, they were really leading the pack on, on the extraction with those saturated group heads and that design. You got um, one more back there. What is that? 
Um, I think there's a La Marzocco two group. Okay. And uh, that's pretty basically it. So let's let's get into Michael. Michael, um, what do you got? <laughs> I'll have to step out of the way. Um, this is a this is a project I worked I've been working on for a couple of weeks now. It's a um, it's a Chimbley M31. Um, but when I get done with it, it's there's not going to be a whole lot Chimbley M31 left. <laughs> I don't think. Um, for example, with a lot of those machines they didn't have. They had buttons that they didn't use. So I'm not sure, I, I can't see what, what you can see, but that looks um, great. I'm, putting a, I'm putting a PID controller in where the two buttons that were not used. Um, so it's gonna be a PID controlled M31. Um, I like Chimbleeks, I think they're, they're built like tanks. Um, right now I am looking at having a soft pre-infusion um, added to the groups. Uh, so it'll be a pre-infused PID controlled um, M31. But I'm also doing something a little a little different. Um, one of the biggest problems with PIDs, PIDs is that when you open the steam taps or when you refill the boiler, um, you get a sudden drop in pressure and temperature, and there's a lag, there's a latency because the PID doesn't know how to control, doesn't know how to account for it. So I'm I'm seeing if I can run a modified pressure switch with a PID controller so that the minute that it falls out of, out of pressure spec, the elements come on immediately. So there's no lag. And then as soon as it approaches the set temp, the PID takes, your, takes over and maintains temperature. That's awesome. Hey, I've got a challenge for the both of you coming up right now. The next, the next one is what is this, okay? And uh, because this is, I don't know, we'll, we'll see how this goes. What is this? What machine is this? <laughs> and whoever wins uh, gets it right. Let's see, where am I here? Okay. First oh, off, that one. I would give you a clue. What language is it in? German. Okay, there you go. Yeah. That narrows it down. I would agree. Valve P, valve two. Um, hmm. Thermostatic uh, temperature controlled. Uh, DC. I'll, I can tell you what year it is. It's 2021. Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of leaning like share or something like that only because it's German okay. and DC this is controlled. Gonna, this I, next I, slide's going to give it away. <laughs> oh, I know exactly what this is. Well, know, okay. Because you're, you're the this, one who told me to, is, to, to, to well, do this. <laughs> this, this. This is a product by a fairly new company called Tone. There it is. And and why did you why did you uh, ask me to put this one up, Marty? And, well, and honestly, by the way, you you all did a pretty good job with just looking at this. You know, I mean, like you you were going down to the valve, you got the valve, but like well, I think that because it's so new, this really doesn't. There was no history to this. So well, we, yeah. we we'll uh, I'll get into that why why we um, think like that here in a yeah. minute. But yeah. but no, Tone is. Um, I don't, I don't want to speak out of school, so I'm not going to say a whole lot, but I do know these guys. Um, we, we worked with them through the time that I worked with Delacorte. Um, and they're fairly new to the market. They were looking to originally come out with brewing equipment that could do one cup at a time and do batch brew. And they've got some products out there that are doing that. But here this year, which was pretty new to me learning this about the same time that they won that best show um, award. Um, this is kind of a, let's call it an instant heat. It doesn't have a boiler. Um, it's thermally controlled um, to whatever nth of degree you need it. Um, you can change temperatures through the brewer. Um, yeah, I noticed that like it said something like it, it was needed. like a, a tankless uh, brewer. So it's basically, hooked up to a water line and, and uh, it's kind of maybe running through a heating element and uh, instantly can change temperature. Exactly. And, yeah. Anyway, now, had, yeah. I, had I done my due diligence, I would have done a little more research on this, um, but my, my goal is to get one in here and let us tear it apart. Yeah. So when we do that, we'll get it on the show. Well, then I, want, I want to move on to uh, the, the Michael segment. And uh, there's a couple of things that I wanted to talk about there. Um, you got I, us on that one though. I, I Well, yeah, well, you, you kind of, yeah, I've, uh, there you go. There he is, Michael, there you are. 
Okay, look that's, what I, that's a look, good picture. Yeah, it gets better. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> look, see, see what I did there? See what I did there? <laughs> Michael, why, why did I, you sent this to me and I'm like, okay, um, there's an obvious issue here. I don't wanna like put the Starbucks, you know, cup mug thing right in front of the, the, the profile, but you know, it's like, there it is. So uh, what's the backstory of this photograph? Okay. You said that there um, was yeah, there, there, there's definitely backstory. Back in 2005, I think um, I gave a seminar at SCAA, and in, in I think it was in uh, uh, New Orleans or Atlanta. Sorry, um, and it was an early morning seminar. It was uh, espresso machine design theory, where we talked about and this this you know 16 years ago we talked about pre infusion, temperature profiling, pressure profiling. Um, uh, fuzzy logic for temperature profiling, um, material composition, heat transfer, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was a, it was an early morning seminar, and they didn't have any of the coffee set up yet for SCAA. And I'm not really a morning person, so I grabbed a 20 ounce drip coffee. And whenever whenever I'm out in the wild, I rarely drink espresso because I'm so opinionated. Um, and so this is pretty safe. So there is there was there was a meme of me giving a seminar on espresso machine design theory to all these industry experts with a twenty ounce cup of Starbucks sitting on the podium, um, and there, there there was no end of laughter about that. Um, but uh, yeah, I did get I did get jabbed a little bit because you know at the time Starbucks was the antichrist for coffee. Oh yeah, back then, but they are yeah, no back longer. Then. Okay. okay. Yeah, now they're just McDonald's. Right. <laughs> well, I, I still like how I cut that out. I think that's kind of fun. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but here, this doesn't uh, this what what this isn't uh, um, this isn't Starbucks related, right? Yeah, I I want to hear a lot about this. What what is going on here? What is this? Okay, well, th this is something that actually exists, um, and it and it and it it did get it. We we got it running, um, but then I made changes to it, and I haven't I I got sidetracked. Um, this is a profiling coffee grinder, um, and it's, it's and I actually do have a patent on it, um, and every component is patented. Uh, and now, of course, a lot of those components are showing up on Mazers and a few other grinders. Um, it is a variable speed grinder. Um, it uh, it's designed in such a way that it'll it'll the, the, the variable speed is from like zero to six hundred RPM. It uses eighty three millimeter conical mills. Um, it the, the, the coffee is actually ground directly above the outlet port. So there's no chamber to collect coffee. It doesn't have to go down a chute or anything like that. It simply goes directly from the mill through counter rotating carbon fiber uh, declumpers through a, a funnel. Um, the prototype is carbon fiber uh, into whatever vessel that you want. And the platform is actually the scale. Um, it's got tenth of a gram accuracy, but I think I did kind of overkill on the uh, on the sensor. So basically, the idea is that um, you, you you whatever 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 you want to brew into, whether it's a French press or a carafe or even a porta filter for an espresso machine, um, you you set that on the scale. the The grinder automatically determines what that is based upon the weight, you know, because it's relatively accurate. Um, and then the motor will spin in reverse and adjust the grinder accordingly to whatever that device has to be. Um, and then it will grind the coffee and portion it out into, you know, whether it's 30, 40, 50 grams, 200 grams, whatever it happens to be, and then shut down. Um, there's also a, there's also a touch screen on the front so you can override anything. So just in case you, it, you know, it missed something. Um, and then you can and you can also very, you can also profile the speed because you, if you increase the speed you can increase the proportion of fines in the coffee because the speed of the burrs the faster it goes you get more uh, uneven distribution of fines so some coffee wants to have more fines than others so I was trying to really you know wrap my head around every possible thing that you can do to profile how the coffee gets ground um, and then all of that data gets uploaded to the cloud in real time. So what you ground, when you ground it, how long it took to grind, what the portion control was, what kind of particular coffee you were grinding. Um, the hopper mechanism is designed so you can actually pull the hopper forward and remove all but about 20 grams of coffee 
uh, you know, whatever, whatever leftover beans you have into a container and then push it back in place. Um, gosh, what else, what else would it, would it do? Oh, it's, volt, it's, um, it's voltage independent. So it doesn't, it, it works on 220 or 110. Um, I, I see it. it I kind of see a difference here between like this photograph. Um, you this see was, like some space. This was a design study. <clears throat> this is a this is a completely oh, okay. different grinder. Because I was wondering on this one, I I don't see a lot of uh, space between the the bottom of this the, the top of the scale and the bottom of of the shoot. How much? It's actually, about it, it, it's about it's actually about. Hmm, looking at it now, yeah, it's about it's about ten inches, twelve inches. Okay, and, and why did you choose that height? So that you could put a French press or a carafe underneath it. Okay, great. And then on this one, this one's a lot higher. And you said this is a different design study? Yeah, th this, this was just something I, uh, I wanted to build. So I've got a coffee shop here in London. I wanted to do something kind of unique. Um, and I don't like straight lines. So um, I had a, um, uh, a grinder, a complete grinder mechanism off a of super automatic um, that had titanium burrs in it. Um, so basically, I built this grinder for the shop. Um, so the entire mechanism is in the horizontal section up front on, on top. Um, it's got a magnetic sensor in the hopper. So if you remove the hopper, it won't run. Um, oh, okay. And then the, 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 the chute, the, the, the outlet port also has, has, is, is magnetic. So you can actually interchange and put different kinds of outlet funnels if you want. Um, it uses a touch sensor. So instead of having a switch to turn it on and off, you simply there's a little silver bar at the base. You simply touch it, and it comes on and off. So, do you have um, any static issues is... with this machine, with this grinder? Uh, I was in the shop for three. Oh, it was I mean, uh, the coffee grounds. Yeah, because oh, yeah. didn't you didn't Big you write an article about static or something like that? Static sucks. It's terrible. <laughs> how do you um, avoid how do you avoid static? God, if you don't. Um, <laughs> okay, so kind of can. Is that another? Control. Is that a, is that another hour? Uh, it, it, well, I'll, I'll see. I'll, I'll see if I can get it down to three minutes because um, anytime you break a bean apart, uh, you create static electricity. You got positive and negative ions, and they all want to scatter in different places. Mm -hmm. um, and on this particular grinder, we did the outlet out of uh, carbon fiber, um, which is static dissipative. So the initial coffee that comes out doesn't have a whole lot of static associated with it. Um, but no matter what you do, static is going to build up. The way, the way coffee grinders mitigate static now is if you take that coffee and you can compress it together, you can, you, you can force the electrons to stabilize. So like on a K30, you've got that declumping thing in the front of it. So what's actually happening is you've got coffee grounds that are built up behind it. That, those coffee grounds are pushing against the declumper and that, that compression is actually what mitigates the, uh, the static charge. It's not really declumping so much as it is removing the static. So when it drops down, static is dissipated because it's just, it's equalized within the coffee grounds themselves. Um, anytime you have a complete uh, like a grind on demand, um, where your portion grinding, for example, where you don't have coffee pushing behind it to compress the grounds to get rid of the static electricity, you're gonna have static. There's 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 not much that you can do about that. Um, that that's way, that really that really clears up the 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 declumper. I've always wondered like mm -hmm. what that what the what the what the purpose was other than other than to have a nice like you know graceful you know. Hey, can we can we back up just a little bit? Yeah, Mike, Michael, you made made two points that I think is worth noting. Um, for those that aren't technicians that's worked on some super automatics out there, running the grinder backwards, and mm -hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, what that does is it allows the, the burrs to move, but it, it grinds nothing. It's basically yeah. nothing will come out. Um, but in your case, you're, you're not wanting to run it backwards just for fun. You're wanting it to allow the distance between the burrs to be changed during that time. Because we yeah. all know if you adjust just your grinder from a coarse to a fine setting, you're going to be crunching those burrs together. And, mm -hmm. and you can actually break things in, in smaller grinders with plastic parts yeah. by doing that. So I think that's, that's a huge, cr creative, very, very thoughtful way to achieving what you need to, to do. And then that allows, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, the user that walks up for their morning coffee, they go, oh, they're sleepy. They, they, 
they're looking down, they, they go, you know what, I'm not going to do espresso this morning. I'm going to do a, a V60 or something like that. You just tell it that you want it at the appropriate grind setting at the mm -hmm. whatever that how wide or how coarse it, you've programmed it to be and press the go button and it makes those adjustments for you. Is all exactly. that. Yeah, I, I think that's spectacular. Oh, that is. And, yeah, that's yeah. pretty, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, the, the other trick is that no, no matter how, how tight you want your tolerances to be, unless you're actually running like a, like a ball bearing worm drive for your adjustment, which nobody's doing right now, um, you, you have to unload the burrs in order to get a proper adjustment out of it. Um, yeah. other, otherwise you're gonna be at one end or the other of whatever the tolerance is on the, on the threads. Um, so that's, that was the idea behind spinning it in reverse. Well, I think that's great. Uh, we see that running in reverse um, in multiple grinder, like regular and decaf in the super automatic world, the automated mm -hmm. world. And the reason for that is they can use one grinder motor to yeah. save, save space and money. And whichever one is running the correct direction is the one that that's going to dispense. And they have different right. angled burr sets, um, grinders burr sets to uh, to achieve that difference between one and the other. So again, very very innovative on your part to utilize that to free up get the get that load or that free up that space between the burrs so that you can adjust them. I think that's yes. awesome. See, see if I can build this damn thing then. And so what's what's in this what's in this photograph we've been kind of looking out for a while we have a belt driven is that a belt a belt driven yeah so it's okay. we're um I mean I'm using a belt drive because I wanted to remove any potential source of heat which would be a motor from the source the, the actual grinding process um it also allows me to get uh the torque that I need I'm using a um uh, uh what is it a, a 35 uh, m30 I think properly. Um, it's a NEMA 34 motor, um, and it's 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 actually the same motor that's that's used on um, an espresso machine being designed in in uh, in Florida. Um, okay. It's position sensitive, so I can actually I can tell it to grind 16.3 revolutions if I wish. Um, it's it's very smart. It runs on uh, 74 volts, 75 volts um, DC. Um, and the gear reduction allows me a little more flexibility and a little more torque, so I don't have to have a massive motor. Um, this actually is a soft start, so when it starts grinding, it doesn't slam the coffee together. It actually spins up, um, and all of that is programmable. In fact, when you first set up the grinder, um, the, it goes through about a 30-minute process of stabilizing for vibration, um, and it tunes all of it out. The top pictures are actually, that's actually the heart of the grinder module itself. Um, because I'm spinning the outside burr and not the inside burr, um, and I didn't have, you know, Fifty or sixty thousand dollars to have them custom made. Um, I made a uh, um, uh, a feed mechanism that actually draws the coffee into the the top part of the cone um, because that's well, that was that was my workaround essentially. Um, and then it, the, the the other picture on the right hand side is it inverted, so that's where the actual coffee comes out. Um, there's been a modification on this. Now, I've, in order to get the coffee to kind of compress against each other and dissipate the static charge, um, the counter rotating carbon fiber brushes as the coffee comes out. I was trying to avoid like zero ground retention, zero bean retention if you don't want to. Um, and uh, on the lower left, the reason why I did the, the grinder head mechanism in that way was to dissipate any potential heat. I also thought the lures looked really cool, kind of like a- They do look cool. Yeah. So, and hey, and and and, and uh, not not to move on too quickly from this grinder to all of the other stuff that you sent me, but I kind of do want to no touch on this. Oh, there's, no, there's no lead. lead it, it, we haven't even gotten to the lead. No, no, no. Actually, that's a that's kind of a good transition. We're going to get to the lead. We're going to get the lead out here pretty soon. But the next photograph that or the next picture that I have, I'm not sure if you send it to me and I can show it. And it was it wasn't the disc thing, it, mm -hmm. you know. But it was the it looks like an espresso machine with some tubes on it. Can I show that one? Yeah. Or was that just what you got? Was that just for my eyes or not? Because I was like, is this? Oh, that. Okay. Yeah. This this was this is can also I, a design study. Can I? Yeah, you can, can show I, this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's too late now. <laughs> too late now. Do I have I have I have all of those other ones too? Is it okay that I show all the other ones coming up? Uh, yeah. yeah um, 
per, yeah. perhaps, perhaps not the video, but you, you, you know, no, you, no video, no video. Yeah. No video. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is an espresso machine. I assume it's not an espresso machine. Okay. Um, well, my assumption is completely wrong. <laughs> is it, <laughs> does it, does it brew coffee? It does. Um, I, I was, I was contacted by a company in Southeast Asia, uh, to, they, they were trying to find a way to automate um, thin coffee, which is Vietnamese coffee. And because the, the process is, is all done table side and it takes 10 or 15 minutes and it's labor intensive and everybody, everyone is always in a hurry all the time. So they wanted something, what, what can we do that would produce Vietnamese coffee? Um, and they never pursued the project. So that's why I can show the photo. Um, they wanted some way to do Vietnamese style coffee um, that was in a central location so they can kind of speed up the process, but still retain the, the, the ceremonial kind of thing about what, what makes thin coffee kind of really cool. Well, so what is um, the ceremonial process for the people who may not be familiar with that? Now, I've, I've been to some Vietnamese restaurants and I've enjoyed the iced, iced Vietnamese coffee with the little tin thing and they put, you know, the yeah. really finely ground uh, with hot water, then it pours over the ice, and it takes it takes a little bit of time, and it is labor intensive. Right. So how does this how does this well, replicate it, that? Well, it's not it's not always done over ice. In a lot of cases, it's sure. it's, it's done hot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this would be this would be a hot solution. Okay. Um, so, and I, I wanted to speed up the process, but not speed it up too much. Um, so what I came up with was um, uh, basically this is a, a four station unit. Those are the, the porta filters actually hold the coffee, but it's not not a traditional espresso machine porta filter. It's kind of like a, a variant of what the Vietnamese coffee filter would be. Okay. Um, and then the cylinders up above actually hold water, and the water is temperature controlled. Um, but rather than pressurize the cylinder, um, the concept that I had, in in part for this kind of ceremonial thing, you know, trying to capture the the magic of whatever it is. Um, it actually has a, a, a granite sleeve that sits on top. Um, so the granite sits on top of uh, like an air pocket, which pushes the water through the coffee grounds. So we're getting a little bit of pressure on the water, on, 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 the, on, the, on the coffee, but not like espresso, you know, pressure, not, right. you know, not like, you know, five or six bar or something like that. And, and um, there's... Yeah, and, that, and that's kind of similar to the, the traditional method where they have the little, uh, the, the, the um, I think there's a piece of metal with a little uh, uh, hold or, or a little stem on it, right, that you put on top right. of the coffee, yeah. Right, so in this case, you know, all the coffee is actually in the handle so that you can deal with the coffee mess and all that kind of stuff and make all that go away. Um, but then the, the, the water, um, you actually refill this, the, the machine will actually refill the cylinders. Um, and then once it when, once it gets to the stable temperature, then you're ready to brew again. So there's actually a, there'll be a temperature display on the left hand side. Because yeah, I was going to ask, how are you going to get the granite pieces out once they sink down? You know. Well, that the water pressure will then push it back up. Pressurizes it back up. That's pure. But, that's but, brilliant. But then the valves close, so you're just stuck with atmospheric pressure, you know, right. and the weight of the stone. The, the other the other fun thing about the stone was like, how do you seal it, right? Um, right. So. The the the, the, the the what I came up with were actually O rings, but the O rings, um, as the stone moves up and down, because the stone will have to be a little bit longer, the the O rings turn and rotate. So it's not like a it's not like a sleeve that that where the O ring is completely sealed. They're actually move. They're actually kind of like a gear reduction almost. They're moving against the glass. Um, and then I didn't want to heat the water directly with an element, so I was going to fill it with. Uh, um, uh, stainless steel, but uh, where it looks like pebbles, um, and then use induction heat. So we're actually heating heating the, the stones to heat the water. So it's completely separate from the heating source. Um, huh. it, was, it, like, it was. That sounds like some sort of exchange of heat or something. I don't know. I yeah. Well, we're using it, it would be an induction heater. So you're you're actually heating 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 the metal that heats the water. So well, it's, it, it was more of an artistic design study and I was pretty sure that I could build it. And so um, this, what is this the other half or what is this? Is this, this, uh... this is something completely different. When, when we first <laughs> opened up the coffee bar, um, I like lever machines. I've got a lever machine in the coffee bar. Um, and a, a friend of mine uh, in, up in Washington has a, a lever espresso machine with, with walnut panels. And 
I was looking at um, actually doing, you know, the old uh, coffee reservoirs on the old espresso machines. Okay. Um, yeah. so there's, there's a guy out, there's a guy out here that's got a bunch of them. Um, and I was going to uh, have essentially a four station reservoir uh, coffee machine using, you know, those old fashioned Gaja kinds of reservoirs. Mm -hmm. um, and if you regulate, the, and, and if you're not worried about steam, you can actually apply whatever pressure you want. So you could, you can hit it with, you know, five or six pounds of pressure. You could essentially make American coffee with those reservoirs using a, a larger boiler in the back. So this was a design study for the back counter that would actually have four of those reservoirs or something like it um, in a in a um, in a walnut paneled machine uh, and the boiler built inside. Um, and that so that's what that was. That was yet another design study. And and um, this looks like an explosion of or a, <laughs> of um, of a box of electrical. It is okay. When, when I was talking before about data logging, um, because like some, that, Marty. Some, yeah, some, some somebody from Didding once asked me if you know, because I, I I told him that I had this. I, I designed a system to convert any any espresso grinder into a dosaless grinder. You basically take off the lid, pop on my lid, um, and if you want a single shot, you touch it once, and if you want a double shot, you just tap it twice, and it will give you a double shot. And all you have to do is plug the grind, turn the grinder on, and plug it into this box. And the doser talks to this box, and this box will then talk to the internet. So, so what this does is, let's let's say Costco's got a, you know, they got those four big grinders up there for grinding all of their, you know, whoever makes their coffee. Um, and if you plug the grinders into this, for example, it will log all the usage on all of those grinders. If a grinder does, and because it has a, a current sensor, it'll also tell you if a grinder hasn't been used. So, and if a grinder is not being used, it's probably because it's broken or tripped a switch or something like that. So this will actually send a text to, look to a, a service company that will say, one of the four grinders at Costco on Las Vilas hasn't been run for the last five hours. Um, maybe you can do a service call or check into it or make a phone call. Um, I have a question. I have a question from above. Dietrich, what do you got? Yeah, coming in from the sky with the with the different mic. <laughs> uh, Michael, <laughs> is, this, uh, is this essentially this... Um, this working kind of in the same manner as like a power line adapter to where you're you're connecting to like the internet via via like the power line then um this actually is wi-fi okay so this has a so wi-fi component inside of it right this is a wi-fi component so that will connect to your router but it also has bluetooth so the blue it'll actually connect to a bluetooth scale um which i think is on another slide um, and also the, the, the touch controller. So for example, you can have a, an EK43 and set a scale on it, and you can have um, an espresso grinder that, you know, and it, now everything's doseless, so it kind of made it all pointless, but um, uh, an espresso grinder, you can plug both into that device and your espresso grinder would then be doseless by simply tapping it. Um, and then that scale would take your EK43 and turn it into a gravimetric dosing system. Wow. So you can say, I want, <laughs> I want 27 grams of coffee. You know, you set it on there and it automatically zeroes the scale and it turns on the EK43 for you. And when it hits 27 grams, it turns off the EK43 and then you go do whatever you're going to do. And and did you just say you could, you just have to say, Siri, I want 27 grams and it will. Oh, Siri, yeah. Siri's terrible. Right. <laughs> no, no, it, it, I, I don't, I don't have voice control. This no voice control. Um, that'd be, that'd be, no. that'd be a mess. No, but, 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 like but, but, I, but, <laughs> but I, but I, but I do have working prototypes of it. And we, we, we tested it with the web interface and um, about five or six seconds after you've actually, you know, made the coffee, it actually uploads the data to, to the web. So if you've got a, if you've got a chain of, you know, say you got 50 different stores, um, you could be monitoring your coffee consumption in real time across your entire installed database or, or installed base with that setup. Oh, it's like Cropster for brewing. Yeah, but exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. um, so yeah, they're, they're, they're all working. They're all prototypes, but you know, I, I'm just a well, one man shop. Hey, I've got 20 more minutes with you and I've got two subjects. One of them is heat exchangers. The other one is uh, lead. Uh, okay. Do you want to try to hit them both in 20 minutes, Marty? What do you think? Too much? Uh, Not enough? Let, we've covered lead, so <laughs> if we've got time, let's go to lead. 
let's yeah let's go to heat exchange well this is exchanging heat i think that you mentioned a little bit of something about that before and and uh you put this you know you you, uh, you you sent these slides to me and uh i thought we could go through them why 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 are heat exchangers in existence and uh um wh what is that <laughs> i just um, want to ask a really basic question um what, what are the, i don't know i mean well, i know what they are here's I mean, the deal you know, and michael just, can handle this yeah. he can handle this there are so many different ways that you can go with this you can go with material difference you can go with design difference you can go with mm -hmm. hydraulic fluid hy hydraulic right. uh dynamics. okay here's so, a question so, so well, here, jump on it well here's a question like does lead have something to do with heat exchanging <laughs> Uh, you know, like <laughs> designs, or is that uh, more for some other type of thing? I don't know. I, what, what do you, why do you like heat? Like you gave this presentation about heat exchange, um, and you seem to be a fan of it. Um, why is I, that? It, we actually hmm. we actually did, did a seminar, um, uh, a webinar, uh, a couple of weeks ago on heat exchangers, um, and okay, I, I, heat exchangers got a bad rap um, because. And there, there, there are probably a million reasons why, but um, back in the 50s, you know, most espresso machines were the lever type espresso machines where the pressure to make the coffee occurred after the boiler. So you didn't have to really pressurize anything. Um, and then they wanted a little more control over the pressurization process and people didn't want to have to deal with pulling levers down anymore. So um, FIME at the time developed a, uh, what's called I think the, the Tartaruga and then there was another model after that, but they actually had separate boilers. It was a steam boiler, and then there was a boiler for making coffee. And that was innovative at the time uh, for 1955, 56. Um, and then there was a big innovation in, in the late 50s, uh, which was the E61 FIMA. Um, and so the, the, the heat exchanger was actually seen as a technological advancement over a multi-boiler machine, which was common in the mid 50s. And the, the, the way that you have to think about heat exchangers is that um, a heat exchanger basically is an element, a heating process. So on a, like on a Marzocco, for instance, you have, a, you have a heating element that's heating the water directly to make the coffee. And that, that heating element is in direct contact with the water. Um, and it can be very volatile. It can sometimes you know, get 20 or 30 degrees hotter than the actual water that's surrounding it. Uh, and, and that develops its, its own kind of latency. So with a heat exchanger, you're, you're actually using the steam and water in the boiler as the heating element itself that's driving the water inside the heat exchanger. So, and the other thing to think of too is uh, when, when it comes to temperature stability, um, when, you, when, you, when you're at the heating elements itself, the water that's directly around that heating element while it's on gets relatively hot because you have to heat up a bunch of water, then that water has to then move and migrate and circulate in order to, to stabilize that temperature. Because temperature wants to always be the same wherever it is, it always has to move. Um, and anytime that you create a buffer between that, that, that heat source and the point of delivery, you kind of smooth out that temperature curve. So for, for example, like on, on, on the drawing that you're showing here on the right, I think that might even be Key's machine. Um, the, the temperature stability that you get at the brewing head is actually more stable than the temperature you're getting at the source of the heating element in the boiler. Because every time you pass through, you know, the, the barrier of the water, then you've got the, 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 the copper jacket of the heat exchanger. And then you have, in this case, a flow through type of heat exchanger where that thermosiphon effect actually increases and decreases in speed based upon the temperature differential between the group and the boiler. So as the, if the, as the head gets hotter, that thermosiphon slows down. As it gets cooler, like when you're first heating up, that thermosiphon is moving relatively quickly. So it has this kind of self-balancing act going on. And if a, if a heat exchange machine is properly set up um, for the kinds of coffee that you want to do, it's exceptionally stable. Um, where it gets dangerous is like this. This is one of the Tartaruga machines here on the bottom. Where it gets dangerous is when you start playing with different blends and different grinds and different varietals and different levels of roast where you want to experiment. Heat exchanger machines aren't really good about making those changes rapidly on demand per use. 
Um, but in Italy, basically, you know, it's 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 quite a bit different. So in Italy, you know, you would have well, this is our coffee. Damn it, we're not we're not going to do some weird, you know, Brazilian small farm. This is this is our blend that we get from our roaster. It's what you expect every single day. So they they wanted that consistency, and the heat exchange machine was really good at that. So what I was trying to show with this graph, and this really isn't data. This is just a representation. Is you can have a two or three temperature differential swing in the boiler. And then the heat exchanger itself will, it, it'll fluctuate, but not quite as much. And then the group temperature will be relatively stable compared to the boiler temperature. Um, and, and it's doing that because it's always radiating heat. Um, one of the guys on uh, Home Barista, uh, and the, the, the coffee geeks on Home Barista were amazing. They, they, <laughs> they've got lots of time on their hands to do lots of really cool stuff. Um, the, the reason why brewing groups are like attached or either like separated from the boiler in such a way um, is that they're always radiating heat. So like, how is it that you can get water out of a boiler that's 120 degrees Celsius, but it only, it's only being delivered at let's say 92. And that's because it's always dissipating heat. It's passing through flow restrictors. Um, it's expanding as it gets, it's going through the, to the flow restrictors, which has kind of a, like a, a refrigeration effect. Um, and this, this was actually a temperature map of, of how much heat is being dissipated the further you are away from the group itself. Um, so all this stuff is kind of designed into the machine. And you know, the, 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 the engineers, and this is always kind of funny to me when, when people were inventing these new espresso machines in the US um, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with all the PIDs and multiple boiler machines. Um, is that people didn't really understand what was happening in the machine. Um, they, they, they understood numbers and they felt that they could, if they could kind of deconstruct the numbers, they could redesign a machine and make it better. Um, and but what I, I think they failed to understand is that most of the engineers that I worked with in, in Europe uh, that were working for at the time, you know, Brasilia or Faima or Chimbali, um, these guys have master's degrees in engineering. Um, the guy that was working on one of the super automatics for Rossi at the time was uh, one of the head engineers from Renault. And his only job was to figure out how to engineer a brewing device so that they can get 50,000 cycles out of an O-ring. That was his whole job. Hmm. So the, the, you know, the level of expertise that they're throwing at this stuff that we, we just kind of, for, for a long time, Italians got a bad rap. Was, they just want to build cheap machines. They don't care. Um, they don't know what they're doing. No, really, they did. Um, and and what, what they were doing was actually pretty astounding. But they simply didn't tell us because they didn't want to tell anybody what they were doing. So we just assumed they didn't know anything. So that's why we developed, you know, like the, you know, and okay, the, and, the, and here, here's the very controversial thing that I'm going to say. The, the reason why twin boiler machines are popular in this country is because Starbucks used them. And nobody wants to admit it. Nobody wants to give Starbucks any credit. Um, nobody wants to say that they were copying Starbucks. But there was a time in this country where the, if, if Starbucks used it, you bought it. And that was probably 20 years ago. Um, and the reason that Starbucks used twin boiler machines was because that just happened to be where um, where one of um, uh, Schultz's friends showed up in Florence looking for espresso machines and just happened to see Marzocco. It's like, that looks like it's pretty cool. Let's get those. So they started importing those, Starbucks bought them, voila, twin boiler machines are the gold standard for espresso machines. And uh, at the same time, you- I would say that's pretty controversial, but you know, it seems they seem to have like hit the jackpot because it seems like oh, people like them. <laughs> they, 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 they took all of that money <laughs> And they threw, like they, they went all in, um, and now everyone is micromanaging boilers. Like this, this is a, th this picture is I think what uh, what the new E seventy one um, and the new Chimbalis do. You can actually individually temperature control, you know, each group. Uh, I think Ranchilia, you can actually temperature and pressure profile each. Sure, absolutely, group, which is pretty cool. You, you are correct. Yeah. Um, so I, I will say that the best coffee I've ever had. Um, is on two different kinds of machines. One is an old-fashioned lever machine, um, <laughs> and and the other is a uh, uh, one of the Rancilio temperature profiling ones that Don was showing me at a trade show. Um, 
But I, I'll never forget what Paul Pratt once said when he was, he, he got into restoring all these 50s, you know, espresso machines. And he was on the forefront of PID, you know, PID controls and Marzocco's. He was a distributor for them in Hong Kong. Um, and he says, you know, I just got through building this, uh, this flame of president from like 56, 57. You know, it's got a mercury pressure switch. The thing is full of lead. You know, we'll talk about lead again. Um, and, you know, I got temperature all over the map. I'm going like a three or four temperature swing. But you know what? No matter what I do, I cannot make an imperfect shot of espresso on that thing. Every time I make coffee, it's absolutely perfect. And I can't figure out why. It just does. And, and so what kind of gets me about all this, the, the technology behind machines is that there's an intangible component to making coffee. Um, sometimes it's the experience of the barista. Sometimes, you know, it's just you've been working with that machine for, for 10 years. You just know it left, right, and center. Um, that, that, that intangible thing we discount a lot and we keep going to the numbers and the numbers and the numbers. Um, I've never met a chef once who's taken a thermometer and stuck it in a pan to figure out whether or not the sauce was properly reduced. You know, if you can't tell by looking at it, you know, throw it away. Um, no, you're absolutely goes, right. Yeah, I, I think there's, the a, I think there's espresso. a, yeah, I think there's a time and a place for, um, you know, you know, educating yourself as a, as, as a, um, as a barista and as a manager and as a coffee professional, I mean, uh, uh, you have to learn. And I think that numbers help you learn, but um, they, sh it shouldn't, it shouldn't uh, 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 be the, how, how it defines your, your, your future, your craft. I mean, you, you have to kind of figure yeah. it out on your own. I mean, it's, you know, like anything else, like photography, you, I mean, you have to start somewhere and uh, you take a class, you learn the numbers, you learn the brew chart, and then, um, you know, learn how the espresso machine works. But um, I, I think that there's a time and a place for it. But I like Cropster um, and roast profiles. Everybody wants to nail it every time exactly the same. Um, I, I just don't think that that's even possible because there's barometric pressure and so many variables that you just have to kind of let the coffee speak for itself and kind of go with your um, uh, with your own experience that you've built up over time. And uh, you'll learn by a lot of mistakes. And sometimes yeah. those mistakes are uh, are exactly what needed to, to to make those improvements because mistakes well, are good. Michael, yeah. let me make make one comment in support of what you were saying. During the all oh, the last twenty years, starting out about twenty years ago when I was first really cutting my teeth in this, I saw a lot of innovation and a lot of people weighing on those numbers like what, well, and they weren't backing up far enough from the big picture that they, were, they weren't paying respect to every component that was affecting what ended up in the cup. And I come up with a phrase on it because I saw it time after time, is that they would focus in on one, one variable and just they would measure it with a micrometer, then they would cut it or they would mark it with a piece of chalk and then they'd cut it with a chainsaw. You know, they just, they would focus in on one little element, but there's so many other facets that's affecting what's in the cup that they, they weren't, they weren't looking at the whole orchestra, if you will. They, they, they just were wanting to control this one thing. I was doing a, uh, we were setting up a machine to test for a coffee roaster in Boston once, and I flown in overnight. I was a little testy, I had a red eye. And we got the we got the machine all set up, and it was it, it it was a machine that was pretty advanced for a time. You know, it had pre-infusion built into it. The pre-infusion you could actually it was a soft pre-infusion that you could enable or disable. Um, and it, we we just turned it on, brought it up to temp. Everything was great. I was getting ready to make some coffee, and you know, we had maybe fifteen or twenty people in the room. And and some kid, I say kid because he was about nineteen or twenty, um, comes in from the back. Um, pulls a thermometer out of his pocket and pushes a button and measures the temperature of the water coming out of the brewing group. It says, oh, this, this machine is too hot. We can't use it. And then puts the thermometer away and says, it's a pointless. We can't even use this machine. And, and I looked at him and I said, where are you from? And he says, I'm from Seattle. I said, so, and that, that, that was your, your hiring qualification is that you were from Seattle and therefore you knew everything about coffee. So do you think that we should at least try to make some coffee out of this thing first? Um, and of course it was perfect and it made you know, espresso like they'd never seen before because I know what I'm doing. 
Um, but again, that what you were saying is true. We're gonna, I'm gonna measure the temperature, and exactly. then that's gonna be the thing. Um, we 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 sent a machine up to, to Starbucks to test when everybody was trying to get their business. This is 25 years ago. Um, same machine actually, and it was a machine that was designed to steam continuously. You could, um, we had engineered it um, so that when you open up a steam valve, you could go to lunch, come back 30 minutes later and the pressure hadn't dropped. It was still sitting at 0.9, one bar. Guaranteed, no matter what, it would just never run out. Um, and they did the same thing. They, they were hooking up all these temperature controllers to it, and they were trying to get the temperature at the brew group, which was not designed like a Marzocco brew group. It's very different. Sure. They were trying to get it, they were trying to get the temperature down because to them, it was too hot. Not one shot of coffee out of it, hadn't even tried to brew anything out of it. Um, they were simply using that temperature analysis as, well, this is going to be, you know, the, the thing. Um, and so I flew in the next day and I said, so, okay, so basically you haven't made any coffee yet. And so you've got a machine that you, you turn the pressure stat down, you opened up the steam valves and you can't get it to low, go below, not, you know, 0.9 bar, no matter what. And the temperature is stable on the group. You can't get the temperature on the group to change. Um, isn't that what you want? <laughs> so aren't you looking for a machine that just doesn't just, change just temperature? And, no, and they and they kind of scratch your heads a little bit. And this is well, can we make some coffee now? <laughs> and it was well, really all about that. How right. many times? This is a rhetorical question for for John. Well, all three of you guys there, um, Dietrich you're in the top or in there in in the sky there. Um, how many times have you dealt with someone that is learning by the numbers and all of a sudden they they hit their numbers and it tastes like crap <laughs> oh i mean yeah oh, has that ever happened uh, only if they do <laughs> only if they cup it blindly will that happen because if they know that what they've done and they followed the rules and they cup it and they know that they did that it will taste better but i tell you if, if you um mix up the cups and do a double blind uh i guarantee you that they will be surprised at that uh, paint by number approach to coffee because they will quickly realize that um, a lot of variations can can uh, quickly um, uh, change the realities. Sure. And I, I think a, a double a double uh, blind cupping, uh, tasting, whether it be espresso or anything coming up, any thing is the only way to, to accurately evaluate. And, and not only one person, but at least three people double blind twice or three times over sure. to really evaluate whether or not that espresso yeah. machine is working properly. And, and, well, another thing to, and another thing to tag along with this as well, I think uh, Kaylee Gann, when we had her on episode Absolutely. 18, we, ch we chatted with her about this as well. You know, you can you can give people whatever numbers they need, but you know, there's no number for the precise grind setting. There's no number for, you know, like how hard they're tamping. There's so many variables that go into making a shot of, of espresso or to making, you know, a pour over, or, you know, all of these, these things with coffee that it, it's just in a, at a certain it's point, a, you got to let it go. It's fine yeah. to have the numbers as like a starting point to get to your, mm -hmm. to your serving point, you know, to where you're like, this is okay to serve a customer to, you know, like it's hitting like parameters and it tastes okay. But like yep. getting it to where it's perfectly dialed in. And, you know, even when I was opening up shops in New York, you know, we'd, we'd open up and, you know, to be fair, like you're going to dial in that machine and it's not going to stay dialed in exactly to that espresso shot for more than like 30 minutes <laughs> or yeah, the, an hour. The, 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 you know, there's, so many, there's so many variables and there's so many things that change throughout the day. Sure. Uh, you're, and every shot's going to be different. In, in some way, shape, or form. Hey, do you know what time it is? It's eight. It's eight o'clock. It's time to talk about lead. Because <laughs> we gotta go. We gotta go. I got. I got other things to do, like eat. It's six o'clock in California. You probably got dinner on the table. So um, making and, it quick. Um, yeah. Let's. Let's. What. What got the lead conversation started? Where that's. Where that. I read from? an article on Daily Coffee News, and um, I saw a sticker on the side of a an Astoria espresso machine. Uh, it said something about in the state of California or, or just this this um, espresso machine uh, will expose you to lead. Uh, if you consume this beverage, you will be exposed to lead. And that kind of freaked me out um, because, you know, I'm selling this machine and uh, I bought it and I'm drinking off of it. And 
historically think I'm thinking, well, every machine that I've ever seen has the, you know, well, not every machine, most of them have the same uh, internal build. So um, are, are we all going to die of lead poisoning? Yeah, what's, That's what's my the question. story there? Michael? What's the story? <laughs> what's the story? In, in the wrap, if everybody wants to read the article, it's on Daily Coffee News, uh, you know, uh, you know, type in your name, read the article, but to sum it up, go for it. Well, the long and the short is we're, we're all going to be, we're all going to die anyway. Um, and so it, <laughs> I guess it's, that it's, works. It's, <laughs> So okay. that works. And, 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 and to, to quote John Maynard Keynes, you know, in the long, in the long run, we're all, we're all going to be dead. So um, death by espresso, okay. so, I guess, but yeah. not, but pro likely not death by espresso. Um, so I'll, I'll try, I'll try to get to the history as quickly as I can. Um, um, copper does not have lead. Boilers do not have lead. Anything that's co copper lines don't have lead. Copper is not I mean, it's 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 annealed, it's ductile, but it but typically that's not the source of the lead. So your copper boiler is fine. Um, the only thing that, that that was an issue were the actual fittings themselves and the brewing group or the manifold where the water came in because those have to be machined. And in order to machine brass without breaking tooling, it needs to be slightly soft. And the old way of making it soft was um, was to have it, to introduce as much as three percent. Um, lead into the brass to make it machinable. Um, and then it became low lead brass, which at the time was one and a half percent. So it'd be one and a half percent lead, but that was the, the, that was the actual component itself. The actual exposure of that component to like the wetted surfaces where the water actually passes through was always relatively small. You could have a brass fitting that secures a flared copper tube to, a, to a, another device and the brass never makes contact. Um, also, anything that's in the steam jacket, pressure relief valves, vacuum breaker valves, all those things, steam jacket is not part of the equation. So um, lead doesn't leach through steam. Um, in the early, early days, uh, when lead started to become an issue, um, they would do lead extraction tests. So they would take a machine, they would sit on the counter, and they would you know, push the button and basically see if they, see if they, they would measure the lead content of water coming into the machine and the lead content of water coming out of the machine and see if the machine imparted any additional lead because, you know, spoiler alert, you're already drinking lead in the water supply now. Um, so it's whether or not the espresso machine added any water. And so for a long time, it, it was kind of about gaming the system. So uh, manufacturers would submit machines and some would pass and some wouldn't, and they really weren't sure why. Um, and then they figured out that if the machine, if they actually pulled a machine out of the field that's been used for like three or four months in a coffee bar, it had sufficient scale built up on the machine, they could actually submit that machine to, to, to NSF and it would pass with flying colors. So no lead, no lead would be extracted. Um, and then NSF got wise to it and said, no, you have to give us a brand new machine that's never been used before, which kind of gummed up that whole system. And then even then, if you tested it right away, it wouldn't necessarily register any lead. So then they would have to, they would require that it be on and sit for 24 hours so that whatever lead might be in the brass and the wetted surface would then leach into the water so they could coax a little bit of lead into the water from whatever the, the parts were. Um, Did they also and, require them to use distilled water? Um, not always. Sometimes they would like, like ETL would simply measure the lead content of the water coming in and the water coming out. Because if, if using distilled water, you're going to suck everything out of whatever thing is in there. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. And the other fun thing is that like nickel is also something that you're not supposed to drink, but anything stainless is automatically exempt, so they never tested for it. Um, so you might be drinking something that's not lead that you shouldn't be drinking anyway, but it's been grandfathered, so it's okay. Um, so then... So it was all this like big cat and mouse game. Well, what if we electrolytically nickel plate all the components? So it, it would be guaranteed to pass all the extraction tests. So they were doing that for a while. Um, and, and, but then NSF didn't want a coating that could potentially come off. So then they, so they made other requirements for, for, for lead extraction. Um, and now they've changed the rules entirely. Um, you could actually have a valve inside an espresso machine made of 100% lead, a solid lead valve, and the machine itself would pass. Because what they do is they, they do an aggregate of the machine. So 
the percentage of the, the weighted percentage of lead in this machine of the, it, it, it's a complex formula, like the wetted surfaces, the weight of the material itself, what the, what the lead content is of that material. Um, and then they would certify the whole machine. And it's almost like the test that the, the extraction test almost becomes pointless because they're doing this calculation for the machine. So, um, so in Europe, yeah. it was point oh, it was 0.3% lead and the US is a 0.25% 0.25% lead because you know we got to be different, which right. then threw all of Europe in a turn in, in, in a tizzy because now they had to redesign everything. Well, how, how so, did you how did you catch the ones that were just trying to like they knew that if they would just make the machine heavier, that they could pass the test. So I mean, you could just build your machine to be heavier, right? Well, most like of the components just build a heavier frame. Um, well, it's not the frame; it's the wetted surfaces. So only things oh. like only things that were in contact with water matter. Oh, so, when, they're, when they're weighing the components of like, okay. Right. So for example, if, 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 you had a, if you had a brewing group that was 0.4% um, lead um, and it weighed eight pounds, you could shed a pound off that brewing, brewing group and then the whole machine might comply. But then the thermal, the, the thermal mass of the brewing group would be thrown off and your coffee would suck. So, but most of the manufacturers now are designing around the 0.3% or 0.25% European standard. So you can make the numbers work, but the, 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 the fun part is, fun part is you can have a, you can have a water valve, for example, that might be low lead. It might be 0.5%. And the valve itself might not comply, but as part of the machine, it complies because the overall percentage, you know, fits with that number. But what that means is that legally you can't buy a replacement valve. You hmm. can only rebuild the valve. So um, but you know, fortunately, most of the manufacturers are finding some way to make a machinable brass valve. Uh, Chamberlain invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into a coating system where they actually coated all the components with a material that doesn't just wash away. It, it, it won't dissipate like, a, like an electrolyzed nickel. Um, but that wasn't good enough for NSF. They had to file all, the, all these kinds of exemptions because NSF actually wanted like a, a stainless steel sleeve that you would insert into the lead-free brass valve, and then that would comply, even if the sleeve was actually thinner than the plating process that you would have used otherwise. So it's this, it's this kind of game of cat and mouse. And the reality is that the, the, the amount of, in order for it to be an issue, um, the amount of espresso that you would actually have to drink in a day um, you would probably die in a couple of weeks anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, so they, I mean, yeah. I, I think I, I think that that yeah. kind of settles it. And um, I, I think that, like, for anybody out in the audience that wants to learn more about what you do, first off, I would say the, the, a quick hit would go to Daily Coffee News at Roast Magazine and, and just read the four or five articles that you have posted there. Um, I mean, you're talking about, do you, I think you're, do you remember all the topics you were talking about on, on Roast Magazine? You did, um, you, did uh, you did this one, you did, um, you learned more about, uh, um, I, I, did a, static a came, yeah, did static? A, lot of, a lot of, a lot of it came from the coffee technicians, coffee technicians guild. Well, hey, let's, let's, they, let's do a shout out for them. Coffee technicians yeah. guild. Just go to the coffee technicians guild from the coffee or especially the coffee association and uh, right. check out their blog and you'll see a lot of what you've written there too. Yeah, because they, they have a, a partnership agreement with Roast. Yep. They, 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 they cross publish. Um, let's see, a PADs, gas, heat exchangers, individual boilers, temperature controls, uh, pressure profiling, flow, like pressure and flow, what orifices do inside an espresso machine, um, you know, why orifices and, are important. And lead. And lead. And, I, and you've, got, you've yeah. got one coming up. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and, and that, that I have to get writing right away. Um, what Let's do tomorrow. Machine? Yeah. Oh, God. Is, no, it's Tuesday. It's due on Thursday. Um, what, what, what makes the machine UL? Right. And what makes the machine NSF? Like, what, what, what is so special about a machine that's listed? What, what are they looking for? Um, well, we'll take a look for that. And uh, I just want to say thank you for joining the show. Um, we've gone a little over time, but that's, uh, I feel like we could do another hour easily. But uh, I got to, I got to go to sleep. <laughs> Long day. But thank yeah, you so much. I really much. appreciate it. And so like, uh, just for our audience, just, uh, you know, we usually ask how, you know, um, again, 
uh, your name, uh, obviously, uh, you know, how we get in touch with you and um, how, how people can get in touch with you. Um, um, well, I'm, I'm, I, I moved my website to a new server, so it's, it, it, it's up, but it's not finished. It's just analog.coffee, um, not .com, .coffee. Uh, so you can reach me through there. Um, or even, you know, you can email me at michael at analog.coffee. Excellent. And Marty? Excellent. Um, What's your name, Marty? Uh, Marty Rowe <laughs> out of Kansas City. Workbench Coffee Labs is our training facility. And we are getting close. As COVID uh, is lightening up a little bit, there's more higher percentage of people with the uh, vaccine. Um, we're feeling a little bit better about it. We've got the curriculum lined up. Um, and uh, Michael, appreciate this. I want to give a just a, a selling feature. We don't teach you how to change parts. We teach you... We share with you our passion to understand how that machine runs so that you can apply that, that te technology to any machine that you run across. Because we possibly couldn't introduce you to every machine out there, but if we can teach you the theory, you can make it on your own. And so that's our, that's our philosophy on that. And uh, that's perfect. Excellent. It's Workbench well, Coffee Labs. Thank you, Michael. And I, I think this is you. you. And, and this has been probably the most coffee geek teched out episode <laughs> that we have had and probably could have. And uh, well, actually, that's not true. We'll just have you on again. And uh, maybe we'll have someone else host the show that can ask better questions. I don't know. We'll keep it in mind. No, Thank fine. you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Awesome. Good night. Thank you. See you. Bye.